Okay, hello all you crazy people out there. My name is Michael. I like wizards and dragons and making games and welcome back to making 3D tower defense games in Game Maker Studio 2. Last week, we uh, we did a bit of an optimization trick and fusing all of these vertex buffers together into a single vertex buffer to make them faster to draw. And um, this week we're going to be taking that a little bit further. So, see, I will pause the game so that the, the ants aren't marching one by one as we uh, as we talk. If you have not seen the recent series of videos that I've been making on optimizing 3D games in Game Maker, I recommend going and watching those because the um, a lot of the stuff that I do in those videos is going to be relevant here. Uh, last week, again, combining all of these vertex buffers and uh, and freezing them so that we can we can draw them all faster and so that we have to do less work on the CPU side of GML and we can offload more of the work onto the GPU side of, well, the hardware that's dedicated to making stuff get drawn in your game, and uh, this week let's do a little more. So last week's video did run a little bit long, and I'm sorry about that. I definitely don't want to split that into multiple videos. It's I feel like doing what got done in that video shouldn't have taken as long as it did, but that's just how development processes go sometimes, unfortunately, and uh, hopefully, hopefully brighter patches are ahead of us. Um, another thing that I probably should have done last time and just completely forgot, like, completely, is I don't actually have an FPS meter on the screen, and I would like to have one of those. So I'm going to go into the, just, I'm just going to add a, a, a little user interface um, widget, and it's just going to be a text label, and instead of showing information about, like, the player's health or whatever, it's just going to be... Uh, it's just going to show the the number of frames per second that we're achieving in this game. And this doesn't need to be a huge text label. This can just be a little bit smaller and close to the bottom of the screen because it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be anything big and fancy. I may disable that. I may add more debug information for when I'm making the game. I may disable all that um, when I actually, like build the executable and give it to people, or I may just leave it there because a something like an FPS meter could be useful for uh, uh, if people want to diagnose problems with the game, they can just look at that and tell me what it says. Anyway, let's see, there is now going to be an FPS meter. I believe I also, when I was looking through the code earlier, uh, these two draw texts that are happening on the screen, those do not need to be there. Those are being completely covered now by the actual game UI that I that I made that actually looks nice a couple of videos ago. So let's just, uh, let's run the game now and see what it looks like. All right, we have an FPS meter that now says 60 and that's pretty much what it should say. Uh, this game is indeed running at 60 frames per second. There are 60 frames being put on on the game screen per second. Uh, the FPS reel is, is more of an, an indicator of frame time and that is also useful information, but uh, it, it can differ from what the actual FPS says. I'm going to make this commit. Uh, let's talk about the Raspberry Pi. So this has been my, uh, my, my guinea pig for performance on weaker computer hardware for a while. And we're going to be doing, we're going to be looking at it again today. Uh, if I were to, if I were to turn on my uh, my screen capture for the Raspberry Pi. And if we were to look at what it says, uh, we are hitting a solid four to five frames per second. So it's taking about a quarter of a second to update, render, and put each frame on the screen, which is uh, 250 milliseconds. Ideally, we get that down to 16. Uh, so we've got our work cut out for us. Uh, the FPS reel is considerably higher because again, uh, when all of, the, all of the level geometry has been fused together, uh, you don't have to spend a great deal of time iterating over every single tree and every single rock that's not doing anything special, and you can just put it in a vertex buffer and leave it there. Uh, so the uh, the Raspberry Pi right now is quite GPU bound. Uh, again, I've been saying this in most of the tests that I've done on the Raspberry Pi when it comes to performance. Again, we've got our work cut out for us. Let me uh, let me switch back to Windows up here because that's where we're going to be working out of. First, there is the matter of backface calling, and I did ac actually actually have this on, and I accidentally turned it off uh, when I was debugging something in the last video. Uh, I do want my calling direction to be uh, counterclockwise instead of um, instead of known 
So instead of trying to render both faces of the triangle, or more specifically, faces of the triangles that are, um, regardless of whether or not they're pointing away from the camera, uh, we will only draw the faces of the triangles that are fo that are pointing outwards, and the counterclockwise sides of the faces will be removed. So we won't spend time in the fragment shader drawing them. So, and honestly, I can just I can just go straight back to the Raspberry Pi. If I were to run this again, we should see a, a small a small increase in performance uh, compared to what we saw before. So instead of four to five frames per second, maybe like five to six frame per frames per second is what we'll be getting. All right, I am actually seeing six to seven frames per second. Which is twenty percent higher than what I than what I had guessed. All right, cool. That's a starting point. There's more that can be done. Honestly, in a lot of ways, counting this towards uh, things that I've done in this video to make the game run better on weaker hardware is kind of cheating because it was there in the first place, and I just accidentally turned it off and accidentally forgot to turn it back on. So, uh, re re-enabled backface calling <clears throat> is what we're gonna call that. Let's talk about shaders. So the lighting in this game is done via a collection of shaders that I wrote called Luminous Chickens. And those are, uh, those are, those are pretty nice, I think. They are a collection of, um, directional point and spotlights, which you can use in either the vertex shader or the fragment shader. Uh, the fragment shader providing somewhat nicer results most of the time. Um, the way this works is there are 16 lights and, uh, they're all enabled like all the time, uh, if you don't have, I should say all, they're all being processed all the time, and if you um, if you don't have a light enabled, it's really just like a black directional light that has zero effect on its surroundings, but it's still being processed, and that is not the most efficient. For one, I can put this in a loop. Um, the uh, the shader compiler really should take care of this and unroll this for loop so that you don't have to worry about like is or is not a for loop constituting an if statement in a shader and you can keep some people on the internet off your back. Um, I need to also do that in the fragment shader, in the vertex shader version. Let's see, where is the vertex shader version? Right here. Uh, we can evaluate, we can put the, uh, the common light evaluate code in a for loop, uh, iterating over each of the lights. There are 16 of them. Now, with that said, 16 lights may be something that you may want if you have like a an atmospheric game with a lot of lighting and pixel fog effects and that sort of thing, but it's um, it's not something I really need in this game. I, I have 16 of them enabled. I could really get away with having two, so one is going to be the directional light that's just there to give the um, um, to give the scene some shading so that you can so that the scene looks like it has actual depth and it isn't like completely flatly lit. And I'm going to reduce that to two. Uh, so we could afford one directional light, which is going to emulate the sun, and perhaps like one point light for maybe a boss is going to carry around a, a flaming torch or something like that. I don't know why they would. Moths draw into flames, flames, whatever. Imagery. We can work on the imagery later. But regardless, we're going to cut the number of, uh, of lights in the shader down to two. And that should help. Uh, what I can also, what I also have to do before I run this and see it have any effect is, um, I also need to reduce the max lights, uh, macro inside the, uh, inside the initialization over here. And then we should, uh, then we should be able to, to have the shader running and, uh, doing a little bit less processing, uh, per each fragment than it was before. And common light evaluate. Did I accidentally copy the wrong thing. Oh wait, okay, so in the vertex shader it takes a couple more arguments. Um, that's, uh, that's, never mind. Alright, copying, pasting, copying and pasting woes. Alright. Momentarily, uh, momentarily panic there. So on my computer it looks exactly the same as before. We have the main directional light. It's pointing um, it's going, I want to say, from the right part of the screen to the left part of the screen, so negative in the y direction. And I think negative in the, uh, ne negative in the x and the y direction, actually. It looks the same, that's fine. Let's switch this back to the Raspberry Pi. Let's run this on the Raspberry Pi. And we have seen, we are finally getting double digit frames per second now, and, um, specifically it looks like about 13 to 14 FPS. Uh, that we're seeing, 13 to 14 frames per second, and that might actually, like, be enough to at least 
fool the brain into persistence of vision. And I'm not going to get into the argument of like, oh, any, any frame rate higher than 24 is meaningless because I don't have the energy to deal with the internet today. But um, generally about 12 FPS is what you need to make something stop looking at least like a slideshow and start looking like things are actually moving. Um, so we, we can indeed see that the ants are, are, are moving and it's definitely better than before. I would definitely like to get that closer to, if not 60 FPS, I would definitely like to get that closer to 30 FPS. All right. So again, we're getting about a hundred and change FPS real and we're getting about a 10th of that in FPS that we're actually seeing on the screen in real life. Okay. So that is, that is one big strategy that you can use to, um, to make a game run faster is make the shader do less work. I am going to uh, commit these changes, reduced the number of lights the shader has to process, and I'm going to switch back to Windows. And possibly the, uh, the most interesting thing, and the most specific thing to this game that I'm going to do, at least that I'm planning on doing right now, that's crossing my mind to do, is um, we have a fixed camera angle. And what this means is that uh, there are some faces, there are some triangles that will never be visible to us. So the, the faces on the triangles that are facing away from the camera, that are facing backwards, that are facing this way, uh, we will never be able to see those because we can't rotate the camera, look up or down or anything like that. Uh, likewise, the faces on the bottoms of, of things, especially the rocks, the bottoms of the trees and that sort of thing, uh, those triangles will never be visible to us because we can't, um, not only can we not rotate the camera, but we also can't move it up or down. And we can't, um, we can't see the bottoms of the trees and we can safely remove a lot of triangles uh, here when, um, let's see, let me, let me pause that so that I don't just die here. Uh, we can safely remove a lot of triangles when we fuse everything together. So, um, I've talked about dot products before. They come up a lot when you're doing shader stuff. They come up a lot when you're doing like 3D lighting stuff. I've also talked about them uh, in the context of doing uh, water shaders in 3D. So if you want to see those videos, I will have links to those uh, to those things around and you can see what we're doing with the dot product. Uh, for those unaware, the short version is that the dot product will compare two vectors, um, two normalized vectors that are pointing in the same direction. So they have the same direction, um, are going to have a dot product of one. Two normalized vectors that are pointing in the opposite direction are gonna have a dot product of negative one and two, uh, two vectors that are perpendicular, normalized or not, are going to have a dot product of zero. So this helps when you do 3D lighting calculations so that you can tell if a, if a beam of light hits a surface or a fragment uh, at a head-on angle and it should illuminate it fully, or if the, uh, if the light ray only hits the surface or fragment at a glancing angle and sh should only illuminate it partially. Um, for our purposes, uh, triangles that are facing away from the camera, triangles that are pointing in more or less the same direction as the camera are going to have a dot product uh, compared to the camera's looking uh, vector of uh, close to positive one. And we can, uh, we can do a little bit of testing in the big loop that fuses everything together so that we can, uh, we can possibly uh, discard some triangles that are facing away from the camera that we will never see. And uh, we don't have to add them to the vertex buffer, so uh, we should be able to um, reduce the vertex buffer in size a little bit, uh, reduce the amount of size that is taken up on the disk in the game files, and we should also be able to um, have fewer vertices and uh, consequentially fewer fragments to process when we draw the scene. And the game should both uh, load slightly faster and run slightly faster. Okay. So before I start, I would like to know just how many uh, triangles are in the scene in total. If I recall, I was messing around a little bit earlier and I want to say there's about 169,000 to 170,000 uh, vertices in the, uh, in the vertex buffer when you fuse it together. To do that, there is a handy function called uh, vertex get number and that takes one parameter of a vertex buffer. And that's just uh, that's just going to return the number of vertices in a in a vertex buffer. Uh, so as obviously the number of triangles is going to be the number of vertices divided by three. So if we have about what 170,000 uh, vertices in the vertex buffer, that means there are going to be 57-ish, 50 high 50,000s uh, triangles 
in the vertex buffer. So let me just run the game and actually wait, 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 wait. Before I do that, I am still loading in the uh, test.bug, the map, the, the fused version of the map. I would like the original version of the, of the map. And I'm going to... This is why I saved it as a copy, by the way, and didn't, like, overwrite the, the old version. Uh, we're going to go through the routine of fusing everything uh, once again. So we have 169,026. I'm going to write that down. 169026 uh, vertices in the sphere text buffer. Okay. That's going to be good to know for later. Now... We have, um, we have the normal of the surfaces of each of the triangles. That is, that is in this array. Uh, normal, new normal is a, basically a vector three in the form of, uh, in the form of an array. It takes three values, X, Y, and Z. Uh, we will also like the camera's normal, uh, the camera's direction, I should say. It's not really the camera's normal. We would like the camera's direction, and that can be obtained from, I'm just gonna, instead of using an array, camera dot two uh, dot x minus camera dot from dot x. Uh, the y is going to be similar. Z is going to be similar. Like this. Uh, this, I don't remember if it's going to be a normalized vector or not, so we can just normalize this. Uh, we can save our cam. This is going to be very similar to normalizing this vector down here. Uh, take the three-dimensional magnitude with the point direction function and divide each of the each of the components by the magnitude. Point distance through D. Like that, and we can just divide again each of the components by where exactly did I I don't know. I hit keys on my keyboard way too fast, and then I get lost. And then I get annoyed, and it's my own fault because I'm hitting keys on the keyboard way too fast. This is a uh, this is a normalized vector representing where the camera is looking. So two minus from. Actually, should it be from minus two? I think this is correct. Um, if it removes the uh, if it removes the triangles that are facing me instead of the triangles that are facing away from me, you can just uh, reverse it. And now we can say, we can take the dot product of the, uh, the two vectors here, compare how similar they are. Um, I can say triangle to camera or something, triangle dotted against the camera. And that can be the dot product 3D. And uh, X1, Y1, Z1, we can make that new Uh, we can make that the uh, the triangles or the vertexes at least normal, and then uh, x two y two z two. That can be the cameras, uh, the cameras vector, and we can say if if the triangle to camera uh, dot product is less than some value, then add the uh, then add the vertex. Otherwise, don't. I am going to make the value something along the lines of like 0 0.8 or so. Um, if the triangle's normal is a uh, dot product against the camera is greater than 0 0.8, it's going to be uh, pointing in about the same direction as the camera's looking direction, and we should probably never be able to see it. Um, and if it's less than that, then we'll be able to see it, and we should add the vertex. So let me run the game now. And this shouldn't make too much of a difference in how the scene looks visually. Unless I got the camera's uh, dot product backwards. And we can hit F3. We can write down the number of vertices that we have now. Just because I'm interested in comparing. I'm not going to do anything with these numbers. I'm just mostly just interested. And does the scene look any different? It does not. Okay, so triangles that are facing away from the camera have been removed. So things like the backs of the trees... Uh, those triangles are gone. The backs of these rocks, these triangles will not actually be there. Uh, we can never, of course, actually see that from where our camera is right now. If you were to implement a, a free camera in the game and allow it to rotate around, you would be able to see that a lot of the triangles are gone. But that's, um, that's not something that the player will ever know since we, again, have a fixed camera angle. Okay. Uh, the other thing, I'm going to commit this first. 
All right, don't include triangles that are pointing away from the camera. The other thing, and this could actually remove more triangles than, than this operation did. This got rid of about 17,000 triangles, uh, vertices. I keep calling them triangles. About 17,000 vertices, maybe about 6,000 triangles. And I think uh, if we remove the, the faces that are pointing downwards into the ground that we will never be able to see, we might actually be able to get rid of even more. So I'm going to do this again, var triangle to ground. It's going to be another dot product, but instead of the camera x, y, z, it's going to be a x2, y2, z2, a second vector of 0, 0, negative 1, because uh, that is the vector that points straight into the ground. Our, uh, the up vector of our world is 0, 0, positive 1, so pointing down is going to be the, uh, the opposite of that. And we will add a second condition to this if statement, if triangle to camera is less than 0 0.8 and triangle to... Uh, ground is less than and I'm gonna make this like 0 0.7 or so because uh, Based on the camera angle I and the fact that we can't actually like move the camera up or down uh, It should be Fairly impossible unless there's like a really huge tree or something. Uh, it should be fairly impossible to actually see uh, a lot of the downwards facing triangles in the in the world and we shouldn't be able to notice if um Let's see if if a lot of those get removed. So let me just like back the camera up here. A lot of these trees have triangles that are facing downwards, either on the undersides of the of the leaves, of uh, the very abstract leaves, or on the bottoms of the stems, which we won't be able to see anyway because those are those are like below the ground, or at least jammed into the ground. And uh, same with rocks. And if I were to F3 to fuse these together, uh, we are down to. 112,893 vertices, which is a big reduction. And, okay, I saw some things disappear. I think that might actually be too high of a threshold. Although I can, I can't immediately spot what disappeared. I don't immediately see anything that's like a hole in any of the trees. I suspect it's like the undersides of, of these. So let me just increase the threshold to like 0 0.75. All right. Not quite, not quite as many uh, triangles going to be reduced, but removed. But we'll be, uh, we'll be getting rid of a lot of them. All right, tab F3 and 124,000 is what we're going to be looking at instead. One, two, four, seven, nine, seven. Okay, and I saw like a couple. Triangles disappear, but looking at it, I don't see anything that's wrong. So I think I'm going to say that's good enough. Yeah. All right. That's pretty good. We've reduced the number of, uh, of stuff in these vertex buffers by about 25%. 169,000 to 124, 125,000. And, um... That shouldn't have affected anything else. That won't be affecting collision or anything. I can F1 to save this. And <clears throat> let's see. Why are we saving here, though? Seriously. Okay, let's save over a test stop bug. And that should have a somewhat smaller vertex buffer that we're going to try and draw. Uh, for for this game, nothing really changed. Uh, the, the frame rate didn't really change. Uh, again, my my desktop graphics card can can swallow fifty thousand triangles in a in a vertex submit, but the other uh, Raspberry Pi is where things are going to get interesting. All right, so let me switch the target back over to that. Let me run the game again, and let me look at how this is going to do on the Raspberry Pi. I'm hoping for close to twenty FPS, if not actually reaching twenty FPS. Okay, before I before I do that, um. Let me go back to test the test map because I don't feel like having to run the editor on the Pi because that'll just, that'll be pretty slow. I just want to see how this is going to perform. Okay, that didn't actually affect performance that much. Uh, we are looking at 13 to 14 FPS uh, again, which is more or less what it was before. I was hoping for at least pushing 20, but that's not really what we've got. Uh, regardless, boy... This is, all right, whatever. I will look into on my own time other things I can do to make this run a little bit more nicely, but 
Uh, in the meantime, we've doubled the, the frame rate that the game is seeing on something like the Raspberry Pi. Hopefully this means that on pretty much like most PCs, even even laptops with integrated graphics, uh, this should um, this, sh this should perform reasonably well. Again, uh, if you if you are watching this, run this on your computer and let me know how it performs and let me know uh, what your what the system specs of your computer are. Uh, hopefully, hopefully this isn't uh, this isn't going to be anything too intense. The uh, the old laptop that I used to that I used to work on before I got this computer uh, had integrated graphics and it could still it could still do a couple hundred thousand triangles uh, before it really started to to complain. So. We'll see. There is one more optimization thing that I want to do, and that is specifically with load times. Um, the if I can scroll down to it, these operations where I am saving the uh, saving the saving the grids, DS grid read. These are unfortunately not that fast. I may leave these for now. I want to. I want to speed them up later. Uh, there are some things I think I can do to make them run faster. Uh, I can just use like raw buffers, and that should be a lot faster to deal with than uh, serializing these things in text. But we'll we'll worry about that later. I'll. I'm thinking I'm going to come back to this when I do other things involving saving and loading files, uh, such as um, like player save data and that sort of thing. Uh, when I do other things with, with file-related functions, we'll see. I know I can use buffers to, to hopefully speed this up uh, dramatically, uh, since that buffers are fa much faster than dealing with uh, text files. Anyway, next time on the series, I am going to start uh, doing things with menus. So when I, uh, when I pause the game, for example, I would like a menu to appear. I may have a, um, a, like a start menu. I may make a start menu uh, and a level select and that sort of thing, a settings menu. I'm probably going to start doing things with menus, and then uh, that'll last a couple of videos, and then... Until then, uh, my name is Michael. I like wizards and dragons and making games. I can... I can try and play this game a little bit, just just for fun. And we can, like, roast bugs who walk past with, diff with various... Oh, that's not going to work, is it? Um, tower defense towers and that sort of thing. I have a Patreon, so if you want to contribute towards these videos being made, there will be links to that in all the usual places. Otherwise, I try to post about two game dev videos a week, one of these and one tutorial tutorial. If you want the code for this, uh, look in the video description for the GitHub repository. Uh, look for the 0 0.40 release for the state of the project as of right now. It's been 40 weeks already, huh? Time flies when you're having fun. I hope you all found that interesting, and I will see you all later. Special thanks to Kiara Elizabeth, Connor, David Key, Edward Holt, Emily Coyo, Halo Factory, Posho, Sindra Larson, Tusk, and Zenith for supporting these videos. If you want to see your name in the credits or to hear yourself shouted out at the end, head on over to the Patreon page down in the video description to join the fun.